said, what's the most important commandment? He said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And they said, who is our neighbor? And he told the famous story of the Good Samaritan. And it's basically whoever you come in contact with. God's just walking down the road and comes in contact with a person who needs help. And he says, that's your neighbor, okay? So this is everyone. Then I want you to notice about this. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. I want you to remember that God was establishing a society, a civilized society. We're looking at the principles behind the commandments, but these 10 commandments are the foundation for a civilized society. A civilized society is a society that is governed by moral laws. That's why, by the way, it's important what laws our government passes, whether they're moral or not. And you say, well, what is morality? And I don't wanna get into a long thing on this, but morality is not subjective. It is not whatever you think is right. It, there has to be uh, absolutes, there has to be an objective morality, and that morality is based on the Bible, on God's word. So we have to have uh, an absolute to base that morality on. But this was a, a legal commandment. You have to, to have another. He's actually saying, when you go to court, don't perjure yourself. That's really what he's saying. Bear false witness. Bear means testify or answer. When you're asked a question, answer. Um, false means, of course, false or lying. And witness means testimony. Don't give. When you're asked a question, do not answer with a lying testimony. That's really what he's saying. So you need to understand that there was a moral code that God was trying to uh, implement through the Ten Commandments. But as I've said on many commandments, I'm not that concerned that you are going to um, lie under oath and send someone to the electric chair. I'm not that concerned that some of you are going to murder people or commit adultery or set up wooden idols in your homes and bow down and worship them. But I'm concerned that all of us violate the principle that's behind the commandment. So the ninth commandment, I, I believe, is the principle of honesty. I think God is trying to put in us to be honest. Um, when I was um, uh, going in my 20s, the first time I ever went through some, what, what, what we would call freedom ministry, we had, they gave us a little booklet that kind of helped you repent. And uh, it had questions in it like, uh, is there anyone you need to forgive? And it just had beside it, yes or no. It, it didn't say, like one, one of the questions would be like, um, have you had uh, impure sexual thoughts? Yes or no. It didn't, you, you couldn't put sometimes. <laughs> or once, you know, you couldn't, you just, it just yes or no. And then there was a question that I want to show you, and I love the way they phrased it, so I want to show it to you. Look at this question. It says, are you a liar? Be honest. Because <laughs> I remember as soon as I saw that, are you a liar? I was ready to say no, and then it said, be honest. And I couldn't put sometimes. Sometimes I have a tendency to exaggerate. Sometimes I tell stories in a little bit of favor me a little more. You follow me? I think we've got to come to place with sin that we call sin, sin. And that's what I think that the ninth commandment is about. So I want to give you three simple ways to develop honesty in your life to a greater degree or greater level than you have now. Here's, here's number one. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Now, uh, I, I told Debbie when I was pre preparing this message, I think this might be one of the most difficult messages I preach because dishonest people are dishonest. Now, what I mean by that is I can be preaching on dishonesty and they've convinced themselves that they're not dishonest. As a matter of fact, the hardest people to help are dishonest people. People who won't be honest with themselves. I, I've even told Debbie, I can't help that person because he won't be honest about himself. 
It's never his fault. Can't pin him down. He's always got an excuse or a reason. There's just no way to help him. I, I'll tell you something too. Um, God won't help you. If, if you won't be honest about yourself. And here's the problem though. What I found is that some people are so hurt and so wounded by their past that they've not experienced the healing that God has for them yet that they have to be dishonest almost about themselves because they can't face the truth. You've met people like this. You say to someone, um, you made a mistake on that report you turned in. And they say something like, yes, I know I'm a terrible person. No, I didn't say you were a terrible person. I said you made a mistake on a report you turned in. You, you, have you ever dealt with someone like that? And they're such a perfectionist that they can't admit fault. They can't admit when they've done something wrong. And I'm telling you, if you can't be honest about mistakes, you're never going to get free. Um, I told you a few weeks ago how I told Debbie, you know, I, I have a problem. When I was in my 20s again, trying to get so many things straightened out in my life, I said, I have a problem, you know, looking sometimes at women. I shouldn't look, you know, help me with this, you know, and her, you know, she said, I will, you know, and she did. And so, but anyway, I, um, <laughs> but on this, I decided the same thing. I thought I have a tendency to exaggerate. And so I said to her, I have a tendency to exaggerate. We like saying that better than lie. I'm a liar. But I said, I have a tendency to exaggerate. And so will you help me? She said, yes, I'll help you. So back then, remember, I traveled and preached revivals and things like that at churches. And um, so uh, we were leaving a church one time, and she said, hey, um, you asked me to help you, you know, when you exaggerate, and I feel like you exaggerated in the message tonight. And I said, really? I said, well, what did I say? She said, well, you said that last week in the revival there were 200 people saved, and there were seven. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> but it started helping me. I actually started underestimating crowds and decisions. And, and please hear me. You can do this, and people will be gracious if you'll say, when you catch yourself exaggerating, if you'll say, no, no, wait, I'm sorry. That's not right. Have you ever done that, or you ever had someone do that? You, you don't get mad at them for that. You just think they're, they're trying to be um, integrous here. So when you catch yourself doing it, be accountable to some other people, be honest with yourself. If you catch yourself, just say, oh, hold on, I'm, I'm sorry, that's not right. But we've got to learn to be honest in everything we say and everything we do. And it starts with being honest with yourself. Here's point number two, be honest with others. Be honest with others. Have you ever been talking to someone and the person say, uh, well, to be honest with you. <laughs> Doesn't that bother you? <laughs> uh, to be honest with you. What? Or here's, here's one. I'm going to be honest with you now. <laughs> now? <laughs> what? what have you been? <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. Now, again, it's an expression, and some of you might have this expression. I'd change it if I were you. Because you don't want to say, sometime, now I'm going to lie to you. <laughs> I've been honest, but now I'm going to lie. Look at this. Let me show you how far God takes this being honest with other people. James 5.16 says, therefore, confess your sins to one another. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Okay, why did he have to say that? I mean, why doesn't the Bible say, confess your sins to God only, under your breath? Make sure no one hears, and make sure you don't have a microphone on at the time. <laughs> confess your sins only to God. Why would he say, confess your sins to one another? Because of humility and accountability. It's called being honest with others so they can be honest with you. Here's the other thing you do. You bring it out of the darkness into the light. So one of the best things you can do is to get honest with someone else. Um, I told you a moment ago, I, I can't help people who are dishonest. And what I found out is that some people are so wounded 
that they just cannot look at themselves honestly. But I've also learned some more. Uh, Dr. Henry Cloud, who's been here, wrote a book called Necessary Endings. If you're in any type of management or leadership, you ought to read the book. Because he said, anytime you're dealing with people or overseeing people, leading people, you need to know what kind of person you're dealing with. And he talks about three types of people that the Bible talks about, wise, foolish, and evil. And you need to decide which one that person is. Wise, foolish, or evil. Let me tell you, a wise person, you can correct. Correct a wise man, he'll be wiser still. You can correct a wise man. As a matter of fact, when you take the truth to a wise person, he will adapt himself to the truth. He'll say, this is the truth, and I'm gonna change to line up with the truth. And he'll actually thank you. He'll thank you, but not a foolish person. A foolish person will make excuses. A foolish person many times will turn it around on you. A foolish person will actually adapt the truth to himself. They say, well, no, that's not actually the way it happened, and da-da-da, and, and he won't receive it. The, uh, Proverbs 9, 8 says, do not correct a scoffer, a foolish person, lest he hate you, rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. So what I found out is there, that there are just some people, they're, just, they're foolish. And, and by the way, here's what Henry says, uh, you cannot correct them with words, you can only correct them with consequences. Well, I'm telling you, the, the bottom line is you have a dishonest person. He has something in his life that he cannot be honest about. And so he can't be honest about himself. By the way, an evil person, you, you reject after the second warning. Uh, Titus 3.10 says, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. The word admonition means warning. So if you have a, a person who's just downright evil, you get rid of them. You can't, have, you can't work with a person like that. So here's what I'm saying. Start getting honest with people. Please. This is a, a, a principle. I'm, you can't imagine the freedom that comes in your life. You don't have to be two people anymore. You can't imagine how many people are two people. They're one public and one private. That's a dishonest person. You don't have to be dishonest anymore. Just be who you are. Let God help you. Let someone else help you. Um, when I talk about being two people, there was a pastor friend of mine one time that, that had an immoral failure. And so I met with him to help him after this. And the Lord gave me, uh, I feel, a revelation. And so I said to him, you know how we talk about two people, like one public, one private? And he said, yes. I said, well, I think the Lord showed me that there are, it's like three of you. Now, I'm not talking about multiple personality or anything like that. I'm just talking about, it's, just listen to the analogy. I said, there's like three of you. I said, one is a man who loves God and loves his family. And I've known that guy for years and years and years. And I know that he's there. He's in there. I know him. The other man is a man who's got, who fell and got caught in immorality and wants to get free. But the third person is a liar and a deceiver. He's been lying to his wife, and he's been lying to me. He's been lying to his friends. And I said, I need you to understand something. I can help the first two. I can't help the third one. This one has to die. If you continue to lie to me, or if you continue to lie to your wife during this process, you'll never be restored. I can't restore you. That person has to die. But I can help the other two people. And, and by the way, great news, he was honest with me, honest with his wife, honest with an accountability group, and he's restored now and pastoring again. You have to get honest. So be honest with yourself, be honest with others, and here's number three, be honest with God. Can you imagine how God feels when you're dishonest with him? I want you to think about it. Let's say that you blew it last week. Let's just say you blew it. But you've talked to God like three or four times since then, but you've never mentioned it. Like he doesn't know? I mean... Like, you ever had a child, you know, hold something behind his back? And you say, what do you have behind your back? Nothing. And you're thinking, you're five years old. 
I'm smarter than you, pal. <laughs> how, do you, how do you think God feels? But here's the amazing thing. He's already paid for it. He not only knows about it, but he knew you'd do it, and he's already paid for it in full. But you won't tell him about it. The problem is you learn to be dishonest with God. The other thing is you learn to be prideful because you can deal with this without bringing him into it. I can deal with this on my own. It's the exact opposite. If you want to get free from something, you've got to bring God into it. And he already knows. I've told you this story before, but I think it bears repeating. Debbie said to me one time, she said, I'm, I'm concerned about something. I said, what? She said, I, I don't have a desire to read the word like I used to. I said, you need to talk to the Lord about it. She said, I don't want to tell him. <laughs> I said, he might have heard you tell me right now. <laughs> he already knows. Okay, so I asked you to turn to Psalm 32. So look, look at Psalm 32, verse 1. Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Notice present tense, is forgiven, is covered. Present tense, it is, and forgiven and covered, past tense. It's already been taken care of. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. We understand about the word impute here. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now watch verse 3. This is David talking. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the, to, uh, to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Okay, here's what he's saying. Until I confessed it, I felt horrible. I had no vitality, I had no strength, I had no, no joy, no peace until I confessed it. And what he's saying is, what took me so long to confess? But let me show you what took him so long to confess, okay? Because we missed this one little phrase. Verse two, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Now watch this. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. Okay, now what I've been trying to tell you is that violating the commandments affects your body, your soul, and your spirit. In order to uh, hate someone or have uh, an idol in your heart or um, um, get in, involved in some sort of a sexual sin, you have to be deceitful. We talked about this. You have to be deceptive. This is what happens when you're dishonest. You're deceived in your spirit. There's deceit in your spirit. What I'm trying to say to you is bring it out in the open. Get it out in the open. Be honest. Be fully transparent. Be vulnerable with God and with others. Um, I remember the first time I lied and got caught. Uh, there was some money on the counter uh, of our kitchen and I took the money. Uh, my parents were um, omniscient. They knew all and saw all, were omnipresent. And so some, so my dad knew that I took it. And uh, so he said, what happened to that money that I put on the counter? I don't know. So he said, well, I know it's here somewhere in the house, so we're going to look for it until we find it. Well, it was in my pocket, you know, so... So we look and look, and I think, well, eventually he's going to give up. He said, now, we're not quitting until we find it, because it's here somewhere. He was, he's hoping, you know, I'd confess. So finally, I remember slipping it out of my pocket behind the living room chair. It wasn't a good plan. And, <laughs> and I said, oh, I found it. <laughs> Must have fallen out of your pocket, you know, or something, you know. So, so he said to me, you, you took it, didn't you? He said, I know you took it. I saw you take it. Okay, okay, I took it. So he takes me out of the room. He said, I'm going to spank you for stealing. So he spanks me for stealing. Then he says, now I'm going to spank you for lying. And I got two spankings. 
Now, my dad did a great job. He did the right thing. But I, I realize now what happened in that moment. Satan put a thought in my mind. I didn't know then it was Satan. But here's the thought that came in my mind after that second spanking. I need to get better at lying. <laughs> I'm going to have to work out the details of the story a little better. I'm going to have to go through this in my mind. And I got good at it. Now, I'm just asking. I'm just, I'm trying to be real with you. I'm not, don't raise, I'm not asking you to raise your hands. But I bet some of you got good at it too. You learned how to lie. You learned how to turn the story where it favors you. You learned how to do it. So the best thing for me was to really get honest. And I felt like the Lord told me two people that I was to get honest with. One, Pastor Olin Griffin that's sitting on the front row here that was my pastor, and Debbie. And at separate times, I got with each of them. I'd written down on a piece of paper everything that I'd ever done that no one knew. And I just thought, this is the best way for me to, to come clean. And I remember with, with Debbie, I, uh, I was, it was seven years into our marriage. I was going through a restoration process. And I said to her, I, I need to tell you who you really married. And I want to tell you everything that I've ever done that no one knows. Everything. And it took several hours. I told her everything. We got down to the end and I said, that's it. That's everything that I can remember that I've ever done that no one knows. I'll never forget what she said. She said, Robert, I knew you were bad when I married you. <laughs> I didn't know you were that bad. <laughs> but I knew you were bad. But I loved you. And I saw in you a person that wanted to deal with the sin he was involved in. And she said, I loved you then, but I, I love you more today because I'll always provide for you. I want, I want you to learn to trust me. Now, Ephesians chapter four, there's a passage that we're going to um, uh, springboard off of today. All three points will come out of one verse. But I, got, I was interested looking at these, these last few commandments that we're in right now, how these commandments, several of them, are in this passage in Ephesians 4. So let me show you this. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, look at verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for, for we are members of one another. Okay, just, just so you know, that's next week. That's, in other words, next week is you shall not bear false witness or you shall not lie. So here's the New Testament saying, put away lying. And then verse 26, be angry and do not sin, okay? That was the one we talked about not murdering because one of the steps to murder is hate. One of the steps to hate is unresolved anger. And here he says, be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, don't let it be unresolved. Don't have unresolved anger because it could turn into hate and bitterness. Verse 27, nor give place to the devil. Last weekend we talked about adultery and how adultery, whether it's body, soul, or spirit, gives a place then to the enemy in your life. And then verse 28 is this week. Let him who stole, now he's talking to believers, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. So all three points are going to come out of, out of this verse. So it says, let him who stole steal no longer. So here's point number one. Stop stealing. <laughs> it's kind of simple, huh? Stop stealing. So if you're going to develop this principle of trust in your life, you're going to have to stop stealing in little ways. And I think sometimes we actually do steal and we excuse it because it's just a little thing. 
But let's go back now to right before he gives the law in Exodus 20, Exodus 16, they're in the wilderness and he provided manna for them. But something you might not have ever seen before is that he provided the exact amount of manna for every person every day. Look, Exodus 16, uh, verse 16, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. One omer, now that's about two liters. We, we don't know what an omer is, but it's about two liters. One omer for each person, according to the number of persons, let every man take for those who are in his tent. Then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less, because it depended on how many people lived in that tent. So when they had measured it out by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who had gathered little had no lack. In other words, everyone had the perfect, exactly perfect amount. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. Okay, so let's think about this for a moment. Since God provided exactly enough for every person if you took more than what you were supposed to take, then you were stealing from another person. Okay, but here's what he said when they went out looking on the seventh day and he told them not to, because this is important. Exodus 16, verse 28. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep, now underline the word keep there, keep my commandments and my laws. Let me tell you what this word keep means. It means a guard or a trustworthy keeper of something, a trustworthy. Here's what he's really saying. How long do you refuse to trust me? How long do you refuse to keep my commandments? How long do you refuse to trust that I'll provide for you? That was Israel's problem. They didn't trust that he would provide enough on that sixth day for two days, and he said, how long are you gonna do this, how long? So that's what stealing is, stealing is a bold statement to God that you don't trust him. Stealing is a bold statement that you don't trust that God can provide for you. So, as I said, how are we gonna make this real for a church full of Christians? You gotta remember that Ephesians, Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus, which they were a part of a very corrupt society. Um, and he said, let him who, he's writing to believers, let him who, stole, steal no more. And don't lie and don't be angry and, and not resolve your anger, okay? So we're, we're, we're part of a corrupt society today. So there's still stealing that goes on. And I really think that Christians steal, steal. Can I say that? S-T-I-L-L, <laughs> S-T-E-A-L, steal, steal. So I'm gonna say some things and you might wanna nudge someone, you might not. You might wanna look straight ahead like you've never had that thought before. <laughs> but have you ever bought anything on an expense account that really was personal? <laughs> Y'all are looking straight ahead. <laughs> never thought of that, nope, nope. Have you ever charged something to the company that really wasn't the company's? Okay, well, I'll say it this way. Have you ever charged a meal to the company that really was personal? And I've heard it. For instance, at lunch we say, how's your business? Great, how's yours? Great, okay, we talked about business. I can write this one off. <laughs> you laughed and then you moaned. <laughs> Have you ever taken a longer lunch than you were allowed? That would be stealing. Um, have you ever paid for something in cash or asked to be paid in cash so you could hide it from the government? Have you ever received too much change back and considered it a blessing from God? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> to not pay one's debts is stealing. 
you borrow the money, you need to pay it back. Not working the agreed number of hours for pay is stealing. Let me say it another way. The Lord owns everything, right? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all the people that dwell therein. Psalm 24, 1. So when you steal from someone else, aren't you really stealing from the Lord? Since he's the one that owns everything. And you know who the master thief is, don't you? <laughs> Very famous scripture, John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Who's he talking about? Satan. He's the thief. Here's number two. Start working. <laughs> Look back at Ephesians 4.28. Let him who stole steal no longer. That was point one. But rather, let him labor, working with his hands, what is good. And then it says that he may have something to give, so that'll be point three, okay? All right, but let him labor. Okay, you might say, I said, start working. You might say, I have a job. Uh-huh, start working. I know a lot of people have jobs that don't work. I know people who work hard and people who hardly work. God blesses hard work. He blesses hard work. This word labor means to grow weary, tired, and to be exhausted to be exhausted. This word work means to earn something by working, to earn it, because God blesses hard work. This is, the, the, the eighth commandment is the balance to the fourth commandment. It's why you need it. You need a day off because you worked. God's plan is that you would work and receive joy from your work. Did you know that? Did you know that God told Adam and Eve to work before the fall? Before they sinned, they were to work. Genesis 2.15, the Lord God put the man, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it. To work it. But work is supposed to be a joy. If Ecclesiastes 2.10, watch this. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. What was his reward? That he worked. I grew up working for my father's company. My father owned the company, and I'd work for him during the summers. One part of his um, company, he was, had, had an engineering company. One part was a surveying company, so I did the land surveying part. I remember one of my friends told me, he said, man, you ought to come work at this other engineering company in town. There were two big ones in our town, my father's and this other one. And uh, he said, man, we don't work. That's what he told me. We don't work at all. And I thought, I was a teenager, I thought, it sounds good, because we work. <laughs> so I actually went to work this company. We get there at seven in the morning, sit around and eat donuts and drink coffee for about an hour. Then we start heading out to the job, then we'd set the equipment up around nine or 9.30. Then about 11.30, we'd break down to go to lunch. We'd come back from lunch, we'd sit in the car and take a nap. <laughs> about two o'clock, we'd set the equipment up again, about four o'clock, we'd break the equipment down so we could be back to the office by five. And we drove slow. <laughs> About a month into it, I quit the job. My dad said, I said, Dad, I want to come back to work for you. He said, why? I said, it's no fun. I, I was a lost teenager. I didn't get saved till after Debbie and I got married. But I'd grown up where you worked. I knew how to work. So, if you want to trust God for provision, stop stealing, start working. Here's number three, get giving. Get to giving, get giving. Uh, Ephesians 4.28 again, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may, I put these words, he may, and I'll tell you why in a moment, that he may have something to give him who has a need. So why did I put the words, underline the words made? Let me tell you why. Because we get to give, we don't have to give. You need to know this, God's not gonna make you give. You, we get to give. Let me say it another way, by the way, and this is the whole premise of the blessed life, most of you know. We get to give, we don't give to get. Isn't it amazing that 
pastors get up and preach, give and you'll get, give and you'll get, instead of, hey, we get to give. So we don't have to give, we get to give. We get to participate if we don't steal, and if we're hard workers, we get to give to those who truly do have a need, who really do have a need. We, we can make a difference, we get to give. Now, um, in my opinion, probably the biggest theft that's going on in the church is taking what belongs to God. And that also has to be the biggest statement of unbelief you could make to God, of not trusting him. I don't trust you that if I do what your word says in the area of giving, that you'll bless me and you'll take care of me. Uh, Joshua 6, when they go into the promised land, remember God said, bring all the silver and the gold into the house of the Lord, the treasure of the Lord. Joshua 6, 19, all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated. That just, it's a, a Bible word that means set apart. This is what the tithe is, set apart to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And then if you remember, Achan took some and hid it in his tent. Joshua 7, verse 11, Israel is sin, for they have also transgressed my covenant, my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken some of the cursed things. They're consecrated when you bring them to the house of God, but they're cursed if you keep it in your tent. And watch this, and have both stolen and deceived. Stolen and deceived, and they've also put it among their own stuff. I just want you to understand, the same way with adultery, to, in order to commit adultery, you have to be deceptive, you have to be deceitful. The same way, stealing, you have to be deceptive, right? You have, you have to learn deceit. Uh, matter of fact, you, you know I love words. I love to study words and the root words, and I immediately, many times when I see a word, I break it down and see what the root word is, and it helps me understand. I'm going to show you a word, so since I told you that, now you might get ahead of, me, ahead of me on this, but look at this word. Look at the word stealthy. Now look at the root of the word, steal. Now I'm not talking about our, our military. Obviously our military needs to be stealthy. They need to fly under the radar and not be detected, but that's exactly what a thief wants to do. A thief wants to fly under the radar. He wants to not be detected. He wants to not be caught. Matter of fact, when the Bible talks about a thief, many times it says when a thief is caught. But a thief tries to be stealthy. So he learns how to be deceptive. Let me say it another way. He learns how to work in darkness, which is where the enemy works. And here's what's amazing when you think about Achan. Achan was, they were going in the promised land, and the promised land was a bountiful land. It was a land of God's provision, a, 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 a land of, of flowing with milk and honey. And they're going into the promised land, but Achan doesn't trust that God will provide for him and his own family. He has to provide for himself, and so he steals some. Here's the amazing thing. He never enters into God's provision. He doesn't even get to enter into the promised land because he, st he stole from God. And let me remind you, this, this represents the tithe. This was supposed to come into the house of God. Please, please, please hear me. Please hear me. I, I don't care how much money you make. You're, you'll never enter into God's provision for your life if you steal from him. It's all through Scripture. You understand? All through Scripture, God was, is trying to put the, the principle of trust in his kids. Adam and Eve. He starts with Adam and Eve. And here's what he says to him. You can have every tree except that one. Here's what he's really saying. Trust me. Trust me. Cain and Abel bring the first into the house. Abel brings firstborn. Cain doesn't bring first fruits. Why? Because he's got to see how much it is before he gives an offering to the Lord. Because it takes trust to give the first part. God said bring the firstborn. It doesn't take trust. You don't have to trust God to wait till your sheep has 10 lambs and then go give God one. It takes trust to give him the first one. Jericho, which is what we just read out of Joshua, he said, give me all the silver and gold from Jericho. Why? Because it was the first city in the promised land. God, God, God is saying, if you'll trust me, I'll provide. 
And so many times, we just won't trust. Please hear me, by the way. If you have to provide for yourself, if you feel that because you won't trust God, you won't do it God's way, you're going to have to do it for the rest of your life. You're always going to have to provide for yourself. It's so much better living in the provision that God has for you. And some people have no clue how much God could provide because they just won't trust. But it's all through Scripture. Think about, think about all through Scripture. Trust me, even though there's a lion's den. Trust me, even though there's a fiery furnace. Trust me, even though the Egyptian army is behind you and the Red Sea's in front of you. Stretch out your hand. Get out of the boat. Rise and walk. It's all through Scripture. God's saying, trust. Trust me, trust me. Now, most Eastern cultures um, invoke the death penalty for stealing. Israel was the only nation that did not invoke the death penalty for stealing. Because God came up with something. Almost the whole chapter of Exodus 22, the majority of Exodus 22 is about how a thief makes restitution. God came up with restitution. And restitution, so I'm, I'm really interested in this this week. God, why restitution? And why when our sins are paid for by Christ on the cross, why restitution? Why does the thief need to make restitution? And I found it in the Word. The Hebrew word for restitution is made of two Hebrew words. One means to restore to its original condition. To restore to its original condition. Here's the other one. The second word means to remove guilt and shame. To remove guilt and shame. So you know what God does with, for someone who steals? See, if, if, you, if, you, if you hurt someone and you can't pay them back, they can forgive you, but you know you can't pay them back. But if you steal something, God says, I'm going to give you the opportunity to restore what you've stolen so that you don't have to live the rest of your life in guilt and shame. I'm going to give you this opportunity. As I told you, my dad owned a company growing up, and um, for some reason, my dad loved to collect silver dollars. Back then, you could collect silver dollars. Every time he'd go to a bank or something, he'd see if they had any silver dollars, and he'd buy them, and he put them in this piggy bank, and I remember he showed them to me one time. And um, when I was a teenager, I started taking silver dollars out of the piggy bank. Uh, just two or three, you know, and then four or five or whatever. And again, I didn't get saved till after Debbie and I got married, but after I got saved, I remembered this. And I thought, I need to make restitution. And I estimated that the most I'd probably taken was 100. So scripture talks about fivefold, a thief restores fivefold. And so, and that's in Exodus 22, it's fourfold and fivefold. And so I said, um, so I wrote a, my dad a check for $500 one day and I confessed to him. I said, I used to, um, to take silver dollars out of your piggy bank. And, and um, he said, I, you don't need to write me this check. I said, I, I know. He said, you don't need to write. I said, I know, Dad, but I need to make restitution. But here's what he said. He said, you don't need to write me this check. He said, I forgave you a long time ago. I said, you mean you, you knew <laughs> that, that I was stealing these silver dollars? He said, oh, yeah. I said that. How'd you know? Because I thought I was stealthy. I said, how'd you know? He said, well, son, I was putting silver dollars in every week and my piggy bank was getting lighter. <laughs> Didn't take a genius. I said, so why didn't you confront me? My dad's a very godly man. He said, I was wanting you to repent. Repent. 